Canada has no official measure of poverty. A lot of organizations use the low income cutoff instead, although it hasn't changed for 20 years despite changing spending habits. A new study now by the Fraser Institute has suggested the basic needs poverty line. It says it'll help measure the problem of poverty in a way that helps it be solved. Time for the big picture. Bill Robson is president and CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. Aaron Weir, economist with the United Steelworkers. Great to have both of you here. Great Thank to you. be here. Uh, so, Bill, let's start with the basic premise. Do we have a problem with measuring this, the poverty issue? Yeah, we do have a problem. The, the commonly used measures that StatsCan produces are relative measures. Uh, so as society gets richer, there's going to be a rising line measuring the people that are relatively deprived. And there are reasons for wanting to look at that. but. When most people think about poverty, they think about absolute deprivation. They think about starvation, right. like literally not having clothing or a roof over your head. And uh, the relative measures aren't so good for that. So what Sarlo does, and what Chris Sarlo does in this study is, first of all, he calculates something that does, it is calculated according to a basic needs basket. And the other more subtle thing is that he looks at that over time without changing it. So the relative measures go up, but this one would enable you to compare, you know, 1970 to today, which the relative measures don't let you do. Aaron, what's your thought? What's the best way to measure this? Do you like this approach that's being advanced here? Well, I think poverty is always an inherently relative concept. Even our conception of what necessities are is somewhat context specific in different societies, in different places and times different things would be considered necessities. So it's a fine exercise to say what's some minimum basket of goods and how much would you need to afford that. Uh, but the truth is Sarlo's measure isn't the only option. Now something interesting happened about a decade ago when the federal government put together its own market uh, basket measure and lo and behold it actually showed that poverty was worse, that it was a larger problem than some of these relative measures. Now there's since been uh, some rollbacks to that market basket uh, measure measure, but I think we should have lots of different measures. We shouldn't necessarily get hung up on trying to perfect the measure of poverty. I think we actually need to focus on solving the problem by getting more money into the hands of people at the bottom end of our income distribution. Although we do, as you say, the, the context matters so much. There would have been a time when uh, for you know a low-income family to have a computer would have seemed like a huge luxury. Today, not to have a computer is a hardship. You know, There's a lot you can't do in the world if you don't have that. Uh, so in terms of how we, how we do meet the needs and define it, how do we get money to the right places if we're not actually taking a good, a good stab at figuring out what does poverty look like in our society today? Well, I think it's still pretty clear that the solution to poverty is to put more money in the hands of the people that have the, fewest mo the, the least amount of money sure. in our society. Yeah. Um, I think that makes sense. I don't think we need to worry about a kind of exact measure of poverty. I kind of see the Fraser Institute in this as a bit like the Kevin O'Leary of uh, think tanks. Uh, his role on this panel often is to be so right-wing uh, that he makes Bill look uh, relatively moderate. Uh, the Fraser the Institute similarly is so right wing it tends to make the C.D. Howe Institute look quite moderate. This is a classic exercise of kind of moving the goalposts using this very restrictive definition of poverty to try to make the problem look smaller than it actually is. So yeah, Aaron's attacking the messenger here instead of getting at the substance of it. So I'll stick up for the Fraser Institute and say that if you look at this study, you'll see that the market basket that Sarlo is proposing is very close to what the LICO currently measures. Right. There's only a few hundred uh, bucks difference in a year. Uh, but the key point is that it doesn't change over time. Right. Uh, he makes the point that uh, these relative measures uh, not only are difficult over time, but when you compare internationally, there was a study by UNICEF a few years ago that said that Canada had worse child poverty than Poland and uh, Slovakia and uh, Hungary. And when you actually use an absolute measure, looking at what people actually had, they, their poverty rates were 10 times worse than ours. Right. But the headlines all said that we were worse than them, and it's just silly to say that. This is one of the things I think that does happen, which is, I guess, one of the reasons why there's something very, um, very tempting about having a clear measure that we all agree on, which is that you do get the sense that the numbers get overstated, they get understated. We, we, we look at U.S. data and assume that we can extrapolate that to mean it's the same here. Uh, so, Aaron, to, to my way of thinking, I mean, it, it's, I think it's sort of obvious to say we'll put more money in the hands of poor people and everybody's better off. Uh, but that, of course, doesn't get you very far when you have to figure out, you know, which people, how much money, where's it coming from. I, what's the, what would you say is the best way to make sure that we're actually getting an accurate figure and who should gather it for that matter? Well, even if you take Sarlo's figure at face value, it suggests that 1.6 million Canadians are poor even by this very draconian definition of a single person living on something like $13,000 
uh, per year. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there is one true measure. And even if there was one true measure, I don't think the goal of public policy is just to bring people up to the poverty line and then they're sure. okay. I mean, I think we do want to bring up the whole bottom end of the income distribution, and that can be a combination of economic growth and job creation, but I think it also requires some redistributive uh, policies. So you said, where does the money come from? Where is it going? Well, it should come from the people at the very top of the income distribution and go to folks uh, at the very bottom. You can do that through the tax system. Uh, I think something like a guaranteed annual income would be worth looking at, or at a minimum, just increase provincial welfare payments. Bill, where does mobility fit into all of this? Because, of course, one of the things you care about is that you have uh, not just, of course, absolute figures, but signs that people can move out of one bracket and into another. When you measure using annual income, you'll catch a much larger segment of the population that is below some kind of poverty line in a given year. Uh, a lot of them would be university students. So right. we certainly hope, and in most cases we're right, that they're going to move out of that. Uh, using the low-income cutoff, I think over a six-year period, there was 2% of the population that was there the whole time. So that's kind of the hard core, yeah. and you want to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, so that would be, I, I think Sarlo's onto something important here that we should have some kind of a constant measure over time. I mean, our conventional way of discussing this would be a world where poor people were thin and rich people were fat. Right. That's not the world we live in anymore, so you got to update your measures. Sure isn't, right. Thanks to both of you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Bill Robson. Still ahead, 